It was not until 550 BC or thereabouts that Pythagoras moved this knowledge out of the world of empirical fact into the world of what we should now call proof. I have one transitional uh, remark, and uh, here's a question. Has anyone really listened to, to Schoenberg's uh, piano pieces, and does, did anyone like them? Like the, the, the completely 12-tone piano pieces, they're almost unlistenable, but I made it like, I thought it was my duty to listen to them every day as an undergraduate until I became smart enough to love them. So I was like, yeah. I don't like this, and something's wrong with me. So I kept listening, listening, listening to it because I wanted to become as fluid and as, as, as yeah. uncentered as an atonal lover would be. I thought it would be like a psychedelic growth experience. Has anyone tried any type of exercises with a Schoenberg's really difficult stuff? Yeah, um, I think it's, you're right, it's an obligation. And I have attempted but not succeeded in fulfilling that obligation. I, I still don't like it, basically, but. Well, I, I, have, I, have, I have trouble with that. I have to rock at the level of other music to me, that's all. I had trouble I, with that for me. because for a while, Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Like, uh, I'll yeah, Jean, Jean. Hello, Jean. Yeah, for me, actually, I, I, I just naturally love atonal music. It's either very well-structured Baroque music or atonal music. I have a hard time appreciating romantic or Chopin and all that because it's just too much drama. So for me, it seems like it is natural to me, but that doesn't mean that it is automatically all atonal music is the same thing. For me, it's, it's a very much minimalistic Hindemith piano sonata instead of a lot of those, you know, uh, 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 orchestral music is too much. So actually among Atonal music, I actually like this Hindemith piano sonata or kind of like a Bach piano sonata or invention, something like that. So there is a difference. So I don't like Hindemith, or, I mean, Schoenberg, it's too much, but I do like Hindemith. So so that's that for me. Well, you know, uh, the, the Schoenberg that I like best is before he developed 12 tone. I mean, he was heading in the atonal, and that might be because I think he became too wrapped up with the twelve tone music, that in a sense the form uh, sort of uh, inhibited his intuition, because before it was just as atonal, but there wasn't a system behind it like Pierre Lunaire. I, I actually like that quite a lot. So I, I in this in this late sixties and seventies, I, I and, and throughout, I mean to to the eighties. I spent a lot of time listening to uh, modern music. I mean, I had trouble with it, but I listened to it a lot. And it's like, but the the problem is became it became so ingrown that if you went to a university, there might be one one composer, and 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 it became so almost academic in the scientific research that in a sense it alienated. That, that a kind of intuition you have to have a, such a commitment to the intellect in a way that it, it became a very difficult but I, I found this out when I went to New York I, I lived in New York for two years in, in the early 80s the most sophisticated city in the world in, in that regard and I went to a, a, a festival of uh, contemporary music I realized I was there and that late morning and early afternoon so it was not the high time but my goodness 12 people showed up i said well wait a minute <laughs> like I, i'm one of the 12 i mean it's like okay if i showed up later maybe there was more but it, there wasn't so many i expected you know if there was any place that there was a jam full of people it would be in new york you know so you know the critique usually goes that um you have to get an intellectual appreciation of it. It's not so to me. It's not a musical appreciation. It's a, a mediated appreciation. And it seems this is exactly the opposite of what he claims he's going for. But I don't know how you hear eleven notes and say I'm really waiting for that F sharp. I mean, if you can't do that, I don't think you can listen to his music because that's supposed to be what it's about you know what's going on. It's making sense to you. And I don't, I don't get it at that level. I just do not get it, okay? But oh, no, no, I, I, I actually understand it philosophically because 
the twelve tone is to make sure there, there's a kind of democracy in the notes, right? Because the problem with traditional music it, is there's a hierarchy of structure, right? Mm -hmm. it, the, the dominant, uh, was, no, I mean the prime is first, and then the dominant, and the sub subdominant, and and the, and then and then so forth down to the leading tone. Sounds uh, Pythagorean to me. Which, which is basically to, to go go on now back to the the prime tone. So so the hierarchy, and, and it's the same thing with cubism in a sense. Instead of putting this a uh, center as the focus, and, and you know, if you look at a, a traditional painting, generally Madonna is in the center and the child's in the center, and then you go out. It, it's kind of like a target. You, you know, ten is right in the middle, and okay. nine, eight, seven, six, and then out. All right. To so, the so, so I don't get what you're saying about how that's music. You're talking about music. How do you put form in something? when nothing is different from anything else. I mean, there has to be expectation. If you can't expect oh. something, what kind of form do you have? I mean, it's like, how do you make sense of the music, right? You can make it louder and bang, bang, bang. You can do rhythm, forget the notes, you know? That's not what they're saying they're doing though. They're not ignoring the pitches. All right, let's 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 say the music because we're actually doing the tones in, in just five minutes and we can, we can go on the, on the tone mode. So, uh, this is Dan's clip. I don't don't even know what it is. There is no place and no moment in history where I could stand and say arithmetic begins here now. People have been counting as they've been talking in every culture. Arithmetic like language begins in legend. But mathematics in our sense, that is, reasoning with numbers, that is another matter. And it's to look for the origin of that, at the hinge of legend and history, that I have come sailing to the island of Samos. He's just poetic there. Is that not just beautiful? I mean, <clears throat> so I, the, the reason why I wanted to pick that is that I've heard this description of um, the... The, the the birth of culture uh, explaining you know the significance of, of Greece I've heard it be described as um, you know like people are always asking where did language come from right and counting like you said counting and, and language um, you know they go way back to our prim primordial sort of old old days right but what he very nicely put into that equation is that the birth of reason uh, happened, uh, you know, from out of Samos and, and in Greece and this type of thing. And so this really lines up nicely with what we understand Greece to be, that, you know, place where, where reason is really abstracted and, and, and kind of brought down to earth, right? So I, I just really liked how he did that. Yeah, that's right. Everywhere around the world was using numbers for trade and for weighing and measuring and stuff like this, and, and we're doing arithmetic. But but only in Samos did the idea of using numbers to make wild inferences to other things uh, pop up, like pure mathematics, jumping from uh, from mathematical fact to fact, and then tying this to space, which, which Bernowski says is the greatest moment in intellectual history. Actually, that's coming up right now. Uh, Phil, do you have any comments? Because because we're going to do the, the content right here. Yeah, I I. I I, I love that moment, but I also find it problematic. Just like I find it problematic when he said splitting rather than the, the hand molding, okay? I, I think he partially solved it. I, I, I don't know if I want to jump ahead because like, because like, you know, you might want to expose this in the, in the linear time. But, but when, he, when he talked about Pythagoras, you know, like that's kind of strange because, like, that happened. Pythagoras was a contemporary of Heraclitus. There was no mention of Heraclitus, right? About the river flows never flows same twice, right? It's like okay, I do appreciate him talking about mathematics and structuring and learning a kind of a deep structure within something. But I think what really happened was when he talked about 
calculus, right? About movement, about life. And it's like he was talking about, once again, about static nature, about splitting the stone, forming categories, understanding the skeleton of structure. I remember I was in a, in a thing with, about Lao Tzu, you know, and, and, and the first uh, statement was like uh, uh, the, about the history was that Lao Tzu was talking about, somebody wanted to ask to summarize, he said, well, I think his main point was he wanted to return to nature. And I asked like, which nature does he want to return to, <laughs> right? The physical nature, which is physics, you know, about, about about atomic structure inorganic substance or the organic nature because what 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 the dynamics came along what you saw is in a sense life you know it's just, just a moment of creation a universe which is about physical nature and it's about uh elements created on its own but organic nature was a whole different moment and I see it as almost a counter nature, not really counter nature, but almost because it's living between the cracks. I was shown a video that was just amazing where they, where they talked about laminar flow and, and am I being interrupted? Should I be uh, about laminar flow and, and, and turbulent flow? And the thing is, the universe is very turbulent if you look at it further away, because if you look at it in terms of circles and all that, they got the wrong, but it's more dynamic. Turb turbulent flow is it's chaos mixed in with what it is, and they showed a fish, a dead fish that was put in the river with turbulence, and the fish actually swim up river, a dead fish, because it had developed a kind of structure that took advantage of the eddies of the disruption of the flow that's much more complex it's almost like chaos theory that took advantage of that that even though one is dead is still moving up river I mean, like, but phil i got a question for you right i mean yeah. i understand you got a bone to pick right yeah because it's it's, it's valid but it's kind of like you're saying that what he's saying at the beginning is that he forgot to say the other side of the story, right? Basically, he forgot half the story. Just, just let me get, and then I'll say, I'll say. So, look at how long it took you to explain that. Right? Like, there's a certain amount of things that need to be like. How do, sometimes how do you say everything in such a short period of time, right? You know, like. Is it? Okay, go ahead, Dave. Yeah, Dave. Yeah, so I mean, you're right. You're right. I, I kind of agree in a sense that he, this is a, a rationalizing um, um, set of movies, so showing you some sense of something concrete and progressive. But Heraclitus, what science do we get from Heraclitus? I mean, there's nothing we can point to. There's no advances. There's not. He's like he's there, and his concepts are great, and they're out there. But in terms of what we're building, we're building with stones. We're building with right angles. And then when they fall, we're noticing they fell, and we say, how far did they fall? And we're doing calculus, which means pebbles, so that we're not doing continuous thing. We're like counting. How well can we count? Is how we make sense, because we rationalized by reducing it to what is a ratio. It's an integer to an integer. It's integral. It's about in the unity. Just yeah. unities matched against each other. That's rationality, ratio rationality. What, this is what, what the Greeks are. Take the R out. They're geeks. They're just what, 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 doing what, what, Yeah. What, what a perfect segue for the next. Let's get some content under our belts here. Uh, what, what Dave just said is actually uh, happening right now. Let's uh, go ahead and uh, roll this. Samos is a magical island. The air is full of sea and trees and music. Perhaps Pythagoras was a kind of magician to his followers because he taught them that nature is commanded by numbers. There is a harmony in nature, he said, a unity in her variety, and it has a language. Numbers are the language of nature.
Pythagoras found a basic relation between musical harmony and mathematics. The story of his discovery survives only in a garbled form, like a folk tale. But what he discovered was precise. A single stretched string, vibrating as a whole, produces a ground note. The notes that sound harmonious with it are produced by dividing the string into an exact number of parts, into exactly two parts, into exactly three parts, into exactly four equal parts, and so on. If the still point in the string, the node, does not come at one of these exact points, the sound is discordant. This is the ground note. This is the octave above it. This is the fourth above that. This is the fifth, another octave above. And this, which Pythagoras did not reach, is the major third above that. Pythagoras had discovered that the chords that sound pleasing to the ear, the western ear, correspond to exact divisions of the string by whole numbers. To the Pythagoreans, that discovery had a mystic force. They felt that all the regularities in nature are musical. I, I, I picked that clip and I thought, I wanted to stop it at various different points and I'm like, oh, I just a little bit more, just a little bit more. I couldn't, I couldn't bring it back. Uh, part of it was, I think everybody in this room and maybe a lot of people watching will go, shit, I already knew that about, you know, Pythagoras and what he discovered with the, with the notes. But it, it felt kind of nostalgic to me to watch it again. You know, like, it's like listening to an old story. It's like, of course, you know, I've heard that before. I mean, like, sit and just really watch it. And I was watching the screens of everybody here, and we were all, like, really watching it, right? So it was kind of cool because, like, how often do we scan through stuff, and we've read it several times, and we go back, and we kind of look for something quickly, but, you know, you can't really experience it again for the first time, right? You know, once you've learned it, I mean, you can relearn it sometimes, but anyways, I just thought I would uh, share that. And then I kind of have a silly question for you guys. I think it's silly because I think maybe it's already been discovered or just, it must have been talked about. But the cave that they discuss in, uh, on, um, you know, Pyth Pythagoras's cave, do you think that that had any, um, correlation with Plato's concept of the cave like because Pythagoras would have come down to Plato right so is there any connection at all between his cave and the one that Pythagoras was in interesting I think they only share the, the word cave I think that's the only similarity be between them uh, mm -hmm. but I, I I'd like this ties into what Dave was saying a second ago uh, against Phil, which is, uh, Phil is the mystic and he wants to flow, he wants his consciousness to flow with the Tao and escape the prison house of language and number and quantity and pebbles and discreteness and all the all this. And uh, Dave's point was that that's fine. Uh, however, if you want to, um, if you want to enter nature and, and be a builder or a maker or something, uh, uh, the models that you're going to use are going to have to be intelligible and intelligible models have to be made up of identities. The ingredients in, in the house have to be themselves. So two has to be two, and cat has to be cat. And um, yes, that is a, a fiction, and that flies in the face of the deep flux that may go all the way down frantically. There may be no identities even at the bottom. Uh, nonetheless, uh, the intelligible thing, A, B, C, the A and the B and the C have to be A, B, C for the duration of the intelligibility um, episode. Wouldn't you say, Phil? Uh, yes and no. Because I, I never, I never complain about the progress of understanding. What I'm saying is that sometimes the structure of understanding excludes other possibilities. 
when when I listen to, for instance, when you listen to words, sometimes the words become so entrenched, they almost funnel you in a certain direction. And when mm -hmm. I listen to words quite often, even in the dictionary, which already does that, there are multiple definitions for a word. And I'm always looking for the ambiguity and the multiplicity that's contained within a particular idea rather than the singularity, right? I'm just saying, don't forget about that part. It's not that, you know, the problem is when you construct a situation of sorts, it becomes so institutionalized within a culture. For instance, I did mention that Archimedes was on his way of discovering calculus that had the Romans not killed him, actually by accident, because they knew he was a smart guy and they needed him, right? But the thing is, what killed him? Because of a structure that built on structure of attaining power. And when he went, when, when they sent a legion to his thing and to try to bring him back, he resisted because, you know, he was on to some or other and, and he was disobeying. And, and I guess the guy who's in charge just got so frustrated that he hit him and did something and that he accidentally killed him. I'm sure that the king or the emperor was really angry because he didn't want him dead. But what I'm saying is that not even directly has built a structure of domination that did allow him to, in a sense, invent eventually calculus, which would, which would have been a thousand years ahead of time right, right. rather than later. That, that's right. all. That's a good point. No, no, that's, 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 that's a good point. You're really taking a, a a grand view there. You're saying that human beings are inertial, we're inertial thinkers, and we're subject to, to cliche thought, which is actually an official informal fallacy, I'm happy to say. And also that we're spoken by, you know, people People aren't agents of speech so much as they're spoken by pre-existing, very familiar cliche bullshit idioms that float around. And it's like, just listen, next time you go on a bus or on a sidewalk, just listen to people talking. You've heard that that intonation and that sing-songy voice that people use today, and, and the, the inflection going up. It's always going up as the question. All this stuff, it's like there's no people there. Like Foucault says, there are no people. There's just these these um, conduits, and they're regurgitating uh, a, 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 a fluvia, like like repetitive, cliche, shared garbage. And so, yeah, I, I agree with you, Phil. That that the. The, the thing to, to worry about is not intelligibility, but rather our uh, our tendency to fall in love with the comfortable, known, and just to be inertial thinkers. Yeah. So right, Phil, well, I Phil's the, the thing, Phil, I, I want are you guys? I want I want to sponsor a Phil's the artist. Scott just painted a picture there. Phil, do you think you could paint that? Paint what? What, what Scott described? Uh, I don't know. No, it's, it's very difficult. I, I think I think I am trying. Oh, uh, l l l let me say something. Like, for instance, we talk about what a discovery does. To me, it's a it provides an entrance into a new idea, a way of thinking. Okay, and I and I remember looking up in the dictionary. Entrance is spelled the same as entrance. We must not forget the moment you make the discovery. Not only are you passing into something, you are also entranced by the opening itself. And yeah. we forget that moment of awe when we enter into a new way of seeing, the entra entrancement, the awe. Right. And therefore, in a sense, we've lost that magical moment because we are so in rush of getting to the other side that we forgot that the opening itself is the is a very very important moment that we should not forget and should stay with us that's why i asked how many times you have to vi visit the rocky mountains how many times you have to ski down the hill before the rocky mountain is no longer the rocky mountain it's just another ski slope yeah D dave what were you gonna say yes yeah, sorry dave <laughs> uh no it was in the, an earlier context uh the phil was talking about uh, the global view, which is kind of what you pointed to, Scott, the, the view of life as a whole, uh, as opposed to kind of incremental awareness and steps and, and progress of that kind. 
which does happen in human interactions. It's like it's communicated between people. When I read books, it's not like blah, 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 blah. you know, it's like there's a story coming out uh, of something that another person with a shared experience means enough to me that uh, I kind of see what entrance they've gone through and I kind of have the new vision. And sometimes it's, it's a conceptual in, in a kind of a, a rational way. So, you know, I think there's, there's sort of, there are conceptual building blocks and there's also when you take the brick out, what else is there? There's everything else. So, you know, there are two sides. They both belong in the story in some way. Now, uh, this is uh, actually an important, this is, so I, I took a Jewish mysticism from Kalman Bland at Duke, what a great teacher. In fact, he does the teaching company things. So this is, the, this is the one fact about Kabbalah that everyone in the world knows is that beauty is a combination of chesed, which is a mercy, it means kind of fluidity and openness, and gabura, which is uh, like a, the imprisonment into form. And so you have to have, like an example that Bland gave is music. Music on one hand, like Schopenhauer says, is this openness, fluidity, change, and flux? It's the flux of the in fact the self is is being waved by the music. So yeah, everything's liquid. But at the same time, the things that are doing this and the intervals that make the meaning of the harmony and the gravity you're talking about, right? We know that a four three suspension has to go to the three. You know, if you have a dominant seven, it has to go to the to the to, to the tonal. It has to go home. I mean, the force is so strong that you hear one, four, five. You know, the five has to go back to the one. So. So beauty is a combination of this flow and, and the prison house. So there's my rant. I just repeated what what Dave said, but this is this, this is such an important point. It's like every religion in the world has this idea of the marriage between liquidity and 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 openness and the prison that allows for meaning, but um, uh, which conveys the thing, but at the same house is dangerously potential. It's it's severe and restrictive. Yeah. Well, there's a, there's something weird and mystical i mean when he presents what he's presenting with pythagoras okay we'd all notice if he counted one two three and he got the numbers in the wrong order but he gave the wrong intervals yeah it was, said, one, it was one five it was, it was one eight five instead of one eight four yeah i mean so something's going but he can say it and we know what he means and like the mystical meaning came across even though he got the words all wrong like he said the wrong thing it's wrong that's great that way, what he's saying is like, it's true, I agree with Phil, it's really embedded in a certain sort of Western, a new scholasticism, which says, oh, the West figured it all out, here's how it works, it's the Enlightenment, and you know, Copernicus is going to work this way, this is how we got to the truth, this is why we're so great. He is kind of in that mode. And when we get to, you know, his glossing by the Islamists, I'll bring that up again. But... What he's saying here, the string has to exactly vibrate at the eight sections. A, a real string doesn't do that. It's not equal sections. That's not the way real things work. That's the ideal. So he's mixing our knowledge of physics as though it's the ideal with the real. And he's saying, you know, we're, we're learning our patterns and we're making them ideal to use our minds. But the real world, it's not really that simple at all it's way complex yeah i i, I want i want to say a word about what daniel's question was about the cave though i think there is a relationship and once again that relationship just might be my my connection rather than a real connection well, what could it be yeah like ancient stories somehow going back and forth between tribes i don't know i'm just i no, I, 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 I i think of it as just a kind of a poetic connection when he came out of the cave not only did he have pride and, uh, and and hallelujah, you know, like Archimedes running out of the bathtub <laughs> naked, right? But he made a sacrifice to the gods and thanked them for revealing to him the truth, right? So th there was a moment where, in a sense, a guy who climbed out of the cave in Plato looked at the sun and suddenly realized that I guess the sun had revealed something that darkness never did. So I think there is a kind of at least a poetic connection to me because mm -hmm. he just didn't think about, oh man, I'm just so wonderful. Like I discovered this, isn't that just great? He had the humility 
to, in a sense, praise God, whether there is a God or not. He prays something greater than himself, which is that's like, that's like, the, that's like the football player doing this after the touchdown nowadays. It's become very, very, very popular. But as far as the cave thing, I can see a connection with like the Zarathustra cave trope. That's that's yeah. where the prophet emerges from with with his boon, right? Yeah. The, the, like uh, Muhammad goes in the cave, he hides, has a seizure. And then, or, or black elk, black elk has a fever, and then he comes out with with a new a new boon, which is a, a, an understanding for the masses. But Plato's cave is a place. It's kind of like where the idiots are. So it's a place of idiocy. So the, the purpose of Plato's cave is to get the hell out. But the purpose of the Zarathustra Pythagoras cave is that's like the womb out of which the great prophet prophet arises. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And anyway, we're here. Okay. Here, here's the next uh, next little video clip. Here we go. Pythagoras has proved that the world of sound is governed by exact numbers. And he went on to prove that the same thing is true of the world of vision. That's an extraordinary achievement. Here I am in this marvelous colored landscape of Greece, the wild natural forms, the Orphic dells, the sea. Where under this can there lie a simple numerical structure? Well, it's clear that it must begin from two experiences on which our visual world is based. That gravity is vertical and that the horizon stands at right angles to it. And it's that which fixes the nature of the right angle. So that if I were to turn this four times, back I come to the cross of gravity and horizon in the world of vision, but also in the horizontal world of experience in which, in fact, we live. I, I like that clip because it shows this, this, this interesting progression from the, the first moment, which is seeing, oh, geez, uh, and it's like a Kantian moment. What's, what's pleasing to me uh, is, is this, these note sequences but I don't know anything about them. And lo and behold, you discover that there's this, it's, it's a whole number rule. If it's, if it's whole number divisions, then you see, wow. So there's, there's this abstract infrastructure, which is a uh, whole number relate, whole number, no divisions. That's, that's what I used to say. It's a whole number, no divisions. And that determines what's, what's pleasing to me. So you go, you go from that. So you have that in the background. It's like, holy crap, numbers, which are these very familiar homogeneous, homogeneous, Transparency, they're, they're nothings and, and they can map onto anything. Two rocks, two apples, it's, it's that's applying math and applied arithmetic is, is a miracle that it's so obvious that it would take an hour, an hour just to get in the safe to appreciate it. So that's in the background. And then the new thing is this, and this is, this is my rant, this is my Marx scene rant against Jung. So human beings are always putting some effort up to stand vertically, so they have a sense of the up and down, and that's there. They look at the horizon and, and they see this, so they're confronted with. What we're eventually we're going to aim downwards. So that's the point of the sequence. So first you have the, you have primates that are looking at like this, and they, they get this for free. For free, they get they get an X Y axis. That all they have to do is look down on the ground, and then boom, geometry begins. Because now they're projecting the X Y on, on the ground, and, and they can, and, and if you add a circle to that, you already have everything you need for, for 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 trigonometry. So you go from the nodes in the string to the free crosshair you get as a primate. To looking down the cardinal points, the circle, and then once once you get that, you're ready for takeoff. I thought that was kind of interesting. Big time. As, as opposed yeah. to Jung. Jung says, "Oh, it's a part of the collective unconscious. Humans just are, are we're built to love the circle with the plus in the middle." I thought, "Oh, this is the this is the best counter to Jung I've ever seen." This 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 little point that Bernowski makes. Oh yeah, it's brilliant. No, he's he's uh, he really nails something here. And he's standing up on a freaking rock, looking out at the ocean. He's like the ocean's going that way, and I'm like everything else. Is, it's brilliant. It's wonderful. Well, and, um, and, and one more thing is, uh, oh, oh uh, what, what do they want to say about this? Gravity. God no! I just had it. I'm, I'm so sad. All right, go ahead. Well, yeah, what, what, once again, I, I have a little bit of an objection. I I, I don't mind what he said. I think is good, but you know, like I, I think it makes me think back of what what a very great artist, Southern California artist, said about Bishop Barclay. You know, if the tree fell in the forest, is there sound? 
if there was no one there to hear it. And he says, he asked the reverse question. He said, is there mankind of trees didn't fall in the forest? Say that again? Well, is there man if trees didn't fall in the forest? What he's saying is that we develop the way we are because nature has provided us experiences oh, okay, yeah. to allow us to develop that, right? So it's actually the opposite question. And the fact of the matter is nature is more complex than his simple geometry performs, at least biological nature. If you look at trees, although we abstractly think of trees as standing upright and vertical, I would bet to say that there are very few trees that are exactly vertical. They are sometimes a little bit this way because of wind factors, all sorts of factors, right? And sometimes other trees are next to it, they have to adapt to that. But on an average, as a statistical norm, we experience verticality because we do not look at the subtleties of each individual thing, but on an average, so we could do that. And so to, to such a degree that our, our intellect, in fact, our cerebral cortex, the, the visual cortex, has these receptors that co codify verticality, horizontality, and to a certain degree, diagonals. And that's why it's so real to us because we actually have those those detectors in our mind that detect vertical and horizontal in a dominant way, not necessarily because it's dominant in nature, but it was a reflection of that in, a, in us. Okay? Yeah, but well, yeah, but how do you actually? You made an assertion. That, you know, on the average they're vertical. How do you know on the average they're vertical? That's okay. an assertion. Okay, so we're making an abstraction out of it. They're definitely not all going this way, but. The, then you say, well, it's receptors that, you know, re respond to nature. They're trained by nature. Those receptors don't exist without the vertical. If you bring up a cat in an environment with no vertical lines, it has no vertical line vision. When you put something in front of it, it'll walk right into it. So what we're just doing is we're filtering from everything we see to make sense out of it. And there are vertical things like, we, you know, so... What's the objection? It's an abstraction. David, can I ask you a question about that? That's fascinating to me about that vertical test. You're saying you can uh, on a cat. Yeah, so you, you're yeah. saying you can take That's something true. out of a cat that will That's lose true. its vertical. Yeah, they bring up cats, they bring up cats in a white environment with only horizontal lines. That's right. And then they, then they make sure the cat's like grown up enough, and then they stick it in a room with vertical poles, and the cat doesn't see them. That's it right. doesn't have receptors that combine the vertical in order to make a vertical line. I got to I got to affirm that experiment. So uh, so in that sense, what what I'm saying it goes back, and I'll go back to the I'll go to the blind spot. We're so inhib we're so habituated to seeing that way that in our blind spot, I did this experiment myself, so I could attest to it myself. That in the blind spot, if you have if you put it you know, something in the blind spot, and then it won't see it, but it'll make up like it's a white background. Okay, put it in a newspaper background, you'll see newspaper. Put it in a red background, see red, okay? I, so so therefore, the mind has the abil ability to also project its understanding onto the world, even if it's not there. So therefore, you also have to be cautious that in a sense, we have constructed of things that project a kind of sort of logical presumption of what ought to be rather than what is. One of the things that as a teacher of drawing, you have to teach people is to forget about the names of the things you draw and draw the thing you actually see. And you'd be surprised. So many people are drawing what they think the thing is and they don't get the perspectives correctly. So you also have to overcome the right. prejudice your mind has created as well as the fact that you need nature to construct that that sort of prejudice for you to exist in the world. That's all I'm saying. Uh, uh, sir, I, it, this, uh, I remember the thing I was going to say a second ago. So, so 
everyone's a monist at heart because we're unified and we're unifying all this stuff. So, but what's interesting here is that Pythagoras was the right kind of monist. He was a monist that, that divided things up into numbers. And when, once you get numbers, uh, you get, um, you have access to everything that could be quantified. So, mm. so, so of all the monisms, his was the most fecund, I guess, right? <laughs> what do you do with a lonely monist? Monist, you know, that's the, you know. Well, you know, I, 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 I have the, I don't know what I should say privilege, but about uh, later in my career, I, I taught typography, a very, a very refined and difficult art form, okay? One of the things I teach my students is that, in some sense, topography, what, what the Western alphabet has given us a certain kind of advantage because the letter themselves don't make any sense. They don't have any meaning. Well, maybe A does, a, a table or whatever, okay? But the letter themselves are made of strokes. They even have less meaning. So we, we start out with construction. So we start out with nonsense, and we have to put nonsense and to make sense out of nonsense. So we are trained in the Western mind in terms of at least reading to make sense out of nonsense, to make understanding out of abstraction, which gives us a great advantage in terms of abstract thinking. If you, if you grow up in an ideogrammatic society, you're based on a, some kind of representation from the beginning rather than that, okay? So therefore, and we have the advantage simply because of that. But that advantage also put us at a disadvantage because we are trapped into the world of abstractions and we are never actually ever connected to the world of representation until we are sophisticated enough to understand the handicap, which was an advantage as well, that it provides us to think abstractly that has to funnel back into a, a real representation of the world. Well, this comes up and changing over from the Roman numeral system to the Hindu numeral system. Mm -hmm. Same thing. The Roman is like the concrete numbers pretty much built up out of the pieces, right? And then they, you can't use that as that's it right, is. That's right. you change it up, you know, like having to write three things for a three is boring. And, you know, to, to try to extend that system and keep doing that right so if we get an abstract system where everything's nonsense then we can use it for the power of the symbols alone they mm -hmm. manipulate by rules that magically produce answers your brain didn't produce it produced it in a you know a power of abstraction so yeah yeah that, that's a very interesting point uh so you have some people that are used to com a, a signs that are completely untethered from when they signify, and it gives us a special power because it may turn out like in quantum mechanics where the thing is nothing but the formalism, like either matrix mechanics or the Schrodinger wave equation, equation after you square it. This, and this has nothing to do uh, with, with anything intuitive. On the other hand, like Phil is saying, is, there's, is there something organic or nice where, where the sign and the signified share something. And so you have humans that think there might be an intrinsic, against Sastor, which Sastor is completely arbitrary, right? There are some humans that see, maybe there is a link between the shape of the Chinese character and the thing that, that so is, so each one has it like an advantage and a disadvantage, I guess. Yeah. Well, you know, we, we've, we destroyed the third, the third language group, which is sort of like the Inca and the, and the Mayan language, which is, we totally destroyed it. I don't know if they could ever reconstruct it, which is even more complex than ideograms. It's it's almost like a whole paragraph. Like, you know, like like I'm just I'm making this up because I don't have any proof of this, but nonetheless, it's something like this. I went down to the fishing hole and caught three trouts that evening when the sun was setting. <laughs> I mean, that's one word. <laughs> right? It's like uh, that's a whole thought. I mean, like We've lost that because we've destroyed that culture. At least we still have ideograms. Could you imagine, like, the way of thinking to bring a unity to a thought that's yeah, com semi-complete already? A paragraph is like it's a word. I like, wow, you know, like, no wonder how complex things are for them in terms of. Is that, is, is that like saying Romeo and Juliet, and now we're all thinking, oh, yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? it's, it's, a, it's a glom. We could call them glom thinkers. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <One. laughs> here's, here's the next clip. Here we go. In five units. It was not until 550 BC or thereabouts that Pythagoras moved this knowledge out of the world of empirical fact into the world of what we should now call proof. That is, that he asked the question, how do such numbers follow from the fact that a right angle is what you turn four times to point the same way? So now we're getting to the, into my favorite part of the video, which is the fact that Bernowski does not locate the regularities of physical form in the, the binding rules of the atomic geometries and in, in the way they combine, but in the flatness and uh, Euclidean-ness and the parallel postulateness, accidentalness of this flat Euclidean space, because it could have been hyperbolic space, it could have been spherical space, but in this space, it's four. 90 degrees that make 360 and he's going to talk about how space itself uh, uh, applies a force to things i thought that was amazing what a what a move that is well wait 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 at any point it's always four 90 degree angles in, in even in hyperbolic in any place but <coughs> i mean i guess it's well, I should, I should say 90 dwelling, on a, dwelling on a subtlety it's the fact that we expect things to move around and stay the same shape so they're movable, you know, like the angles of the triangle don't have to change as you move it along, or if you make it bigger, they can keep the same angles. They really can on a sphere. They really can on anything, you know, on anything except a flat plane. If you make the lines longer, the angles have to change, and it doesn't add up to 90 anymore. You know, but at a point, because you go smaller and smaller, it's more and more like what he's showing us. So the Greeks overlooked the global for the local, but the local is absolute. So do these idealists that everything, the plane can always be extended forever. The line can always go forever. And you're always, you can go more along the line. You know, this is the, this is what makes their system work. But it's kind of like Phil said at the beginning, kind of dead. Everything in it is just static. Mm. And that's not the real world, no. But it's a good way to think until you're ready to do something a little trickier because, you know, you have to start somewhere. <laughs> This is the baby step, right? That's brilliant. I like that explanation, David. So that was Pythagoras' question. Uh, that was a very short clip. So, he, so the question is, everyone knows three, four, five. That if I give you three, four, five long, long, long sticks, it's like, wow, uh, you always get a 90 degree angle. But uh, so but Pythagoras is gonna ask the further question is, how is that related to the four times 90 degrees uh, of flat space? Now we have a square on the hypotenuse. And we can, of course, relate that by calculation to the squares on the two shorter sides. But we don't need any calculation. A small game, such as children and mathematicians play, will transpose that triangle there and this triangle here. And now we've constructed an L-shaped figure with the same area, of course, because made of the same pieces, whose size we can see at once in terms of the smaller sides of the triangle. Let me put that divider down. Then it's clear to you that there is now a square here on the shorter side of the triangle and a square here on the longer of the two sides enclosing the right angle. Pythagoras had proved that not just for the 345 triangle or any Babylonian triangle, but for every triangle, the square on that hypotenuse is equal to the square on here and the square on here, if and only if that angle is a right angle. To this day, that remains the most important single theorem in the whole of mathematics. That seems an extraordinary thing to say. But it's because it's the first time that the structure of nature is translated into numbers. 
and the exact fit of the numbers describes the exact laws that bind the universe. Oh, yeah. So there's the great link between numbers, which are perfectly calculable in abstract space, and now look, lo and behold, space maps on the number. Once you get space mapping on the number, you get you get analog geometry, and then you get the calculation of not only figures with algebra, but even uh, time states uh, and time values with algebra. And once once you get time inside of algebra with your mechanics, then all of space time is calculable, and we're finally gods. Good uh, hand raising uh, going on, Phil. You're up. Yeah, I I am. Uh, this is not objection, but uh, but I was mystified that. The thing that attracted me the most is that square in the middle. The mm -hmm. little square that is in the hole. Those of you that know mathematics might want to explain it to me because it might be my lack of understanding. To me, yeah. it's kind of very mysterious. You don't that, need it. I know. But but the thing is, it's mysterious because the hole ha was filled, and then he filled it in order to explain about the second, the bigger square, mm -hmm. right? Like. I, I wonder whether that is a, a, a kind of a, a kind of representation of the black hole. I mean, it's like I'm just wondering because, like, why is that not explained? Why is that little square that's inserted inside of this other thing, which he had a very complete explanation for, but he forgot to leave out the part that he brought in that shouldn't be there because this was the absence of the thing itself that became the presence of something. Like, well, he had, he had a lot he didn't say. Like, the <laughs> proof is a lot easier if you start with saying, hey, what is area? Why do I call this a square? And why does square to us mean multiply the thing by itself? Well, he skipped all that. So we think of area in terms of filling it with little squares that are all perfectly little squares. And we want a one unit by one unit. Now, that's a bunch of assumptions. I mean, the proof he did didn't have a number anywhere. He just said the area of the big square is the area of these two little perfectly wonderful squares. That's all he showed you. <laughs> he didn't know anything about any number there. So if he had started with a one-by-one one perfect square and slid it across the middle so you have a, a one area, now you have a half area. And, and he did his trick with four of them, you'd have a square figure with no hole in the middle and four halves. It would be two, okay. two, an area of two, and the, the diagonal line would be some magic, you know, thing. So there wouldn't be a hole. The point of the hole is any right triangle, if it's not an isosceles, when you fit them together, you got a little space left, but it's a perfect... You can use all right angles to fill the space that's left. So whatever area it is, it builds a bigger square for you when you need it. That's all he did. There's a lot of talk, isn't it? But that's, you know, I don't think it's a black hole yet. Maybe. And then, but what I what I like about it, now, they, tell me if I'm if this makes sense, because you brought this up in your point, right? You said, you said when we're taught at a young age, we're taught – and there's a lot of things missing in the explanation, right? You were saying, but it's like you multiply this by this. And I'm thinking back in the very kind of first fundamental ways that I was taught. And it was, that was the starting point. Like there's nothing underneath of that. Right. Yeah. Right. But, but what, what happened, why this was really nice is because it was a visual representation of squaring. Right? Ah, so you, the whole relationship of square, seeing it all like that. I, no multiplying, nothing. It's really geometry. I don't yeah. think the fact that they did this, and then probably they said, and this square, we'll call it side A. You know, I guess and that's how they did it. But it's big A plus big B equals big C. And C was the hypotenuse, and A was this, and A was the A and B were the squares, not the lengths. Yeah. So that comes, yeah, right. That comes out of a whole thing about what am I thinking of as area? And again, that's flatness is really the significant thing that makes that geometry 
play out with the Pythagorean theorem. Otherwise, you don't get the Pythagorean theorem. Well, I, I still don't understand because it seems to me the square that he had to bring in to make it back into a solid to begin with, the missing square, yeah. it, it, it's kind of like it's kind of like Einstein's uh, sort of fudge factor to make the no, hard. No, it's not. Okay? It's I mean, not. it's like it's not that. No. I mean, because it seems to me like he had to bring in something else. That that Bill, can that, I bring in that, a suggestion? Think of it, guys. If I'm right on this, it's this the scalability of a square can go down and down and down. It can go up and up and up. So okay. it's that's what he's that's what he's filling in. It, if you actually just shrunk it down, you could take that. Mm, little square and move it to nothingness or infinity, whatever you can just and make it disappear. You can make the square like this. Is that right? Well, like, like like Dave said, if, if it's forty five degrees, there is no center square. But if you deviate from forty five, then there is. Because you're allowing for every possible right triangle in your imagination. So he's not choosing the one special one. He's saying, take a cockeyed one. Hey, this works fine. It'll work for any right triangle, and you'll get some area in the middle that's still the area of the big square. Yeah. You need to represent it with a stone so you can measure and compare it to what's left when you move the other guys around. So it's the legitimate remainder of the big square, but it adds on to make a big and a little, just the exact amount. Yeah. Yeah, just the exact, the exact amount. All right, here's the next one. The Alhambra is the last and most exquisite monument of Arab civilization in Europe. The last Moorish king who reigned here until 1492. And this is the most secret place in the palace. This is where the girls of the Hoim came after the bath and reclined naked. Blind musicians played in the gallery the eunuchs padded about, and the sultan watched from above and sent an apple down to signal to the girl of his choice that she would spend the night with him. In a Western civilization, this room would be filled with marvelous drawings of the female form, erotic pictures. Not so here. The representation of the human body was forbidden to Mohammedans. Indeed, even the study of anatomy at all was forbidden, and that was a major handicap to Muslim science. So here we find colored, but extraordinarily simple geometric designs. The artist and the mathematician in Arab civilization have become one. And I mean that quite literally. These patterns represent a high point of the Arab exploration of the subtleties and symmetries of space itself. Begin with a very straightforward one. Here, obviously, the translations, the reflections, asymmetries are straightforward. But note, one more delicate point. The Arabs were fond of designs in which the dark unit of the pattern and the light unit of the pattern are identical. And so if for a moment you ignore the colors, then you can see that you can turn this dark unit once this way through a right angle into this position, then always around this point, into this position, and again around this point, into this, and back on itself, exactly like the Pythagorean square. A much more subtle pattern. These windswept triangles form only one very straightforward kind of symmetry. You could move the pattern this way or up into a new position if it went there. But suppose you neglect the difference between the green 
the yellow, the black, and the wild blue. And think of the distinction as simply between dark triangles and light triangles. Then there is also a symmetry of rotation. Fix your attention on this point. This triangle can be rotated then into that position, then into that position, and back here, a threefold symmetry. And indeed, if you forget about the colors at all, then you could move this triangle into the white space, because it's identical in shape, into the dark, into the white, into the dark, into the white, and back a six-fold symmetry of space, which in fact is the one that we know best, because it's the symmetry of the snow crystal. There's another uh, silly question, but I think there's some, mathemat there's some mathematical um, expertise on this panel tonight. <laughs> so, um, have we have we done anything with um, a five rotating ge geometry with finding any kind of symmetry in it with you know something like fractals or or anything like that? I, you uh, can create solids that have symmetries that are fivefold, but you can't fill space with them. Uh, you, yeah, you, um, it's a problem if you're sticking to the plane, which is what he's talking about. There are just a certain number of symmetries, like 17 things you can do on a plane. They're the magic symmetries. Uh, higher dimensions, different numbers. You're on mute, my friend. <laughs> I can tell you what you're talking about. Okay, yeah, so you know, you know, I think Dave, Dave's talking about what kind of shapes can infinitely fill a plane in tessellation. What shapes can, be, can, can you fill up so that there's no gaps? And so there's only a few, and then there's the Penrose tiles. All, or, but those, they fail, don't they? You, you, the the your Penrose tiles can't, can't go to infinity. Uh, they just, right? You, the, things end, the things end at some, at some space, I think, anyway. Yeah, so, so that's the, the problem isn't, isn't can we have regular five faceted objects? It's could we, can we, can we put those things together um, um, contiguously gaplessly so that they fill infinitely. I mean, we have an icosahedron that has five at the at every point, you know, so it becomes a perfect solid. It's a bunch of oh. equilateral triangles, five at a point. And every you, you continue that, and it comes around to the bottom, and it meets up perfectly, five at a point. So I, I, so Scott, I have a, I have a question, right? I mean, what, like, why the, why the addition of two infinity on that? I, and it, this may sound silly, but it's like, if you're making it from a material sort of standpoint, I mean, even in, and I guess like, a, you know, putting a, a limit on your calculations as well, right? It applied sort of mathematics. So why would you not just be happy with? Um, the mathematics working out and there being no remainders or leftover, right? In manufacturing, you call it like waste or yield, right? Well, he's, talking about, he's talking about lattices, I think. When he's talking about yeah. those, those crystals, he's, he's talking about lattices. So those lattices go off forever. So, so they, have to, they have to have a symmetry that allows them contiguous infinite stacking. Otherwise, you couldn't make a room bigger than a certain size because the pattern would fail. And then you've, or if it's the universe, the universe would have to stop there. But you know, the 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 the, the, the I had a, I got a different point from this, because, what I got from it, that despite of, showing the kind of yin yang symbol in a way, it's like, in the most secret place when you put it into, the domain of mankind, with power. In a sense, the mystical or the magical or the divine serves power, right? In other words, like even these religious symbols of infinity that goes on and on to express the ideal of some religious thing itself, in the hand of power, it becomes the sacred place where men are gazing at women, <laughs> right? And they forgot about Mother Earth in a sense, and life itself that provided in one sense is like they become these sort of play objects because the musicians are blind. 
They're not allowed to see the women, the naked women. The uh, the eunuchs, well, they could see, but they can't do anything. Right? <laughs> it's like it, it's kind of like then the power structure becomes dominant by using this sort of device, which is well, like, kind of analytical yeah. device in order to harness the thing they truly desire, which is that. And it it's reminds me. It's not egalitarian, but who's to say? I mean, you know. Yeah, but but what I'm saying. Of power egalitarianism is also an issue of power yeah. being. Equal. Yeah, but what so I'm it's called power if you look at it one way or another. But what I'm saying is that sometimes when you get too lost in these sort of like intellectual issues, you forget about other issues that are important. And what I'm going to continue to say is that it reminds me so much of the Japanese culture, which is so sensitive, but they have this other power structure. Supposedly, the emperor is the living god, but the living god is often controlled by the shogun, <laughs> right? So they have two controlling powers, and you might wonder why is it they fought so hard, the bonsai charge, everything's, you know, kamikazes and all that, the fight against Americans, but as soon as Americans won, they're familiar with the general coming in as the super shogun, <laughs> that controls the emperor. I mean, it's like when you're situated in a, a situation with men who wants power, then all this sort of other thing, which is supposedly so important, becomes a tool and instrument of control. That's And that's the part we cannot forget, right? Because even in the West, there were not naked women, but there was a lot of paintings of naked women, just to remind us where the yin is at, yeah, right? It's like, okay, so that's interesting that the support, the thing that allows us to transcend and get more understanding in the final analysis funnel back to really usurping what it is that you want. The Greeks had a lot of naked men statues. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that secret room of the of the naked women is called the internet now. It's the internet. Yeah. Uh, you know what I like about the Greek? Uh, I was thinking about that today as I was walking the dog. Is I was thinking the uh, the idea of the Greek statues, right, and artistic expression, and you have you know an entire culture. And I know you know partially where this came from. The Egyptians they're doing a lot of the same similar kind of art. Uh, you know, this type of like production orientated sort of, this is kind of how we traditionally do it, right? But why the Zenith seems to be so magnificent for, you know, the Greek origin is that it it seems to have, you know, gotten to a point where there was still enough social cohesion for people to work together towards something, but yet be wildly, uh, you know, discursive and 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 whatever, but look at the beauty that they actually produced. Now, the only, the, the idea of perfection, right? This idea, like, how, how, do you, how do you perfect something like that, right? We, we, we still haven't in, in many cases, like of some of the statues, right? So it's, I don't know, I just think it's such a, um, a, a beautiful um, illustration of, of, you know, where those ideas came from. Their idealization. Um took sort of a lot of the human stuff and eliminated it because it created imperfection in their art. So I don't think they really wanted to represent the muscular structure and stuff like that getting in the way. They wanted this idealization of the body. They didn't want human expressions that, you know, showed life experience. They really wanted to make a sort of an idealized, you know, gaze and, Per perfection of something, but it's like sort of the opposite of what some of our sensibility of what art can depict, which is the humanity of a moment and a person mm -hmm. and an individual and a, a second, a, an instant, as opposed to a universal glory of some sort of flattened out ideal forever that will yeah. live forever, right? 
Well, I remember the uh, the the uh, there was one particular Greek that that started the first composite by taking three different women and laying you know for for him to kind of you know do his his artwork on right and it was this first idea of of, of a, comp a composite right mm -hmm. is being able to take things in the form of uh, a final uh you know sort of portrait so i think that even suspending suspending your images and combining them from different people right uh you know that's that's really interesting it was something we just kind of do intuitively now right i mean uh, you know, we can we can pick up on people's characteristics and whether or not it's a, a, like a, a muscular or beauty feature or something like that. It could be a fashion or it could be, you know, we're differentiating when we th when we're thinking. Right. Is this, you know, foundational to value or but it's just like categories, really? Well, when they they had to choose between three women, look at the war creative. Yeah. Or, well, you've heard the trope about whether she had a long nose or something, right? You know, Cleopatra. No, I, oh, no, really? Yeah. Like, what if she had this, like, horrific Godzilla nose, right? How the world would be different. Or if, uh, you, you know, Julius Caesar did it, decide to not to cross the Rubicon, you know? <laughs> like, or, or, I mean, you know, or, or wasn't at the Capitol later on in life, you know? <laughs> right? Like, what would the world be like? So that's this really interesting to me. So, uh, 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 suppose like, they have coins of Cleopatra, and she was not a beautiful woman. Well, not the coin, no. I was like... Yeah, I mean, it's like... Uh, so So Julius Caesar was not... Well, she wasn't so ugly that, you know, like, you, you can't stand to look at her. But what I'm saying is she he was interested in power, and she was very, very powerful and very clever. And so that he he that was the thing that attracted him because he wanted to unite the Egyptian kingdom with with, with Rome, you know. Yeah. So that was a a very much about the marriage of power rather than the marriage of beauty. Yeah, but when one thing that I would add to this is that I I still try and imagine what it would be like, you know, to be seduced in that way in that culture with that mind frame. I mean, we, we can now, we can say, yes, it was about po power, but within that power structure was passion, right? Yeah. There, because, it, it, you know, it's not like it was void of passion. It was just void of the the kind of like romantic love. And just so it, I'm just, it, you know, you try and imagine what it would be like to, to be, a, you know, somebody, you know, like that to meet with Cleopatra, right? And then see how powerful like what were the, the 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 dancing like and the music and the you know like i don't know it would be really cool to experience that fun to try and imagine it too uh, you have to you have to imagine yourself as a person whose role is to care for your whole society because wow. you're going as that particular you're going as Rome, right? In a certain, or not yet. I guess he wasn't the ruler yet, was he? Um, definitely on the. He was thinking that way, right? It wasn't like I'm doing this and then I'll make, you know, I'll make a surprise decision. Like he, he seemed pretty focused on what he wanted. Vice president wasn't the the goal. <laughs> right. I mean, it's, I guess it's still confusing for people in the monarchy and in these weird families that are monarchical families. You know. Uh, their social roles and their personal lives are like, seem to me really psychologically confused. All right, well, uh, this next clip is the transition to time that Phil has been waiting for. This is the uh, birth of dynamism. And I was, I thought this was also great because it, it really didn't begin with time. It began with the fact that the deep perspective drawing well, you have to take into, into account your, your place, the place of the viewer, and that's a temporal function. The obvious effect is to give to visual space a third dimension. Just as the ear about this time hears another depth and dimension in the new harmonies in European music. Contrast this fresco of Florence, painted a hundred years earlier, about 1350 AD. There is no attempt at perspective because the painter thought of himself as recording 
things not as they look, but as they are, a God's eye view, a map of eternal truth. The perspective painter makes us step away from this absolute and abstract view. Not so much a place as a moment is fixed for us. All this was achieved by exact and mathematical means. The apparatus has been recorded with care by the German artist Albrecht Dürer, who traveled to Italy in 1506 to learn the secret art of perspective. There is this perspective thing happening, and uh, once upon a time there was a perspective and uh, it's hard to imagine, but uh, they didn't know that there was this, uh, that there was this, um, that you could grid your paper up in a way and then just put every object on the grid and it would be perfectly accurate. And, uh, because the artist wasn't representing the empirical and the phenomenal, but the ontic. And so Jesus would be gigantic and then people in front of Jesus would be smaller than him, even though they were in front of him. So it was just, uh, we, it's, it's bad art in our view, but it's, a, it's hard. It's, it's just, I guess, I don't know. You'd think that the humans back then would look at a painting and they'd look at reality and they'd see the mismatch and they would complain, but apparently this, this wasn't happening. But this is one of those questions that people, that horse theories always ask. Like, it's like, was perception really different? I mean, we, we, we're kind of loose with that and say, yeah, they weren't really perceiving it. They didn't have the equipment yet. They hadn't developed it yet. But did they really not, did they, were they really not feeling the absence of proper perspective when they saw those paintings? I, I don't think so, Scott. I don't, because there's, a, I think there's a lot of examples in history where there's a mismatch on like perspective and size. A lot of the primitive types of depictions don't seem to be, you know, geared towards a realistic representation. So, I mean, that's why it seems to be such a, um, a unique singularity that that the that the Greeks actually emerged like they did, right? To express it so completely, and then I I saw that perspective from the God's eye view, and I thought, you know, it would it would make sense to have a religion that represented the way that that people, you know, basically dominant, the you know the the majority of people kind of thought, right? But the difference I think now is that you don't have the same fundamental psychology. There's too much of an individual aspect to our psychology. It's not you can't take that away now. It's mm -hmm. it you know, it's there is seems to be like this progressive changing of of of, of um, you know Dasein, I guess right man. Well, isn't there, there's a lot to play with too because it, it, I guess it depends on what your intent is when you put a canvas up and you start to mark it. Um, because if you drew, you know, the refrigerator and microwave behind me here, you'd make these teeny little things looking at my Zoom with my mathematical pixel count. I would do that. But if you went far, 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 far back and you set up your telescope and you looked at me, I would be small compared to the refrigerator. We would assume our correct sizes. I would be, the further away you go, the more things go back to their full size in the projection. So, right, it really depends on what is the meaning of your point, and it feels like his head, your point of view, and what are you making, what's really big to you? The same way someone will present in a psychology lecture, look at these, this checkerboard, and there's something in front of it that casts a shadow, but these two squares are really the same color, you think they're different. But in real life, which is what your brain is interpreting, this is a three-dimensional thing. They are not the same color. Nothing in the real world could produce, you know, the same hue if they were the same color in reality. So you're taking reality and interpreting it. And then when you're going to go a step further and express it on a canvas, what are you trying to say? There's not one objective way to depict something that's the right way, unless you say it has to match my camera at this f-stop on this distance with this, you know, just, it's a different question. That's not the question. Uh, I, I think it's, I think it's even different than that. It, it, it's very major. 
because to shift from a, a divine perspective or, or, or a grand perspective to a uh, human perspective is it's close to blasphemy because you know like uh and i think this idea of let's say the human point of view instead of the god's point of view is kind of it's kind of the beginning of the waning of religion in this sense because we begin to lose more and more respect for in a sense god as existing in nature itself uh, and, and I kind of think what happened is that, in a sense, you know, like what Copernicus uh, rediscovered the Greek uh, geom uh, the, the Greek mathematics. He really thought the sun was the center of the earth. By the way, that that was commissioned by the Catholic Church because the Julian calendar, you know, was off by a quarter of a day <laughs> every year. And by the time you gone a thousand years, is like way off. Now the Roman would have solved it practically by saying, you know, uh, well they wouldn't have waited that long. But you know, like after many years, twenty five years, they'll just have a holiday to the emperor, right? That sort of thing, right? But when you when you really actually believe now, because God is blended into the Roman culture, then in a sense it's a divine structure. And you don't dare change the calendar. And yet, when you shift it that way, it, like it's off. And so that's why, you know, like it, it was merely an idea. But when, but when, uh, when Galileo discovered moons on Jupiter, oh my gosh, <laughs> you know, like even the, even the epicycles are kind of not working. Like, my God, you're like, and I think. I think the Pope, not that he would be in his right thing, but he could have easily put him to death. He just put him under house arrest. So they, he, they, the Catholic Church, were in some sense, very liberal. Just he just just keep quiet, right? Just keep quiet. He is actually saying the Pope is actually saying, yeah, the human race can't handle this right now. <laughs> well, yeah. So it depends on what kind of God and what kind of church or religious structure you have, whether right. or not you pay attention to these signs in nature, because the Islamic world took the opposite point of view, which was the more you are going to portray it the way it is, the more you are honestly examining what God has created. So we'll get together and debate whether your representation is better than his representation. I, I'll hide them, you know, when, who is like really just dismissed a little before this. Uh, I, maybe he was doing maybe he was doing the cones. Maybe he was doing the cone demonstration about the the light rays coming in. This was the one who said light doesn't come from the thing out of my eyes and and contact the thing. Light comes to me from the planet as it comes around and it's revealed and I see it. That's when the light comes to me. So light is all reflected or from a light source like the sun. So he starts to put and the brain assembles it. So they began to. And his warning is, our job is to doubt. Scientists are supposed, your job is to be a skeptic and doubt everything you've been told and then demonstrate in a way that's going to convince somebody else. That's the only, don't, and don't be biased for your own demonstration. Oh. I know, but, but no, but the, but the Islam is even worse because you're, you're right, between the Greeks and the Christians and, and the Renaissance, they were the most progressive in science. But they stopped science way before that because they already realized it contradicted religion. So the, the high point of, I think, Islam was something like 900 AD. No, 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 I, I, no, I think you got the thing all wrong because they calculated the size of the earth and they, the Greeks were 17% accurate. They were 1% accurate. They I calculated know, but, how far away but, the sun was. They but got what, that but what, but what I'm saying is that when the religion began to, began to be a dominant factor and they began to stop, you know, in the sense science, I mean, because they, they just stopped way before I was really in the Renaissance. But this film, you got... No, no, no. They, proposed, they proposed orbits that were elliptical. And the, the calculations that were used were the, by Al-Tulsi 
were exactly the ones in the Copernican document. So he seems to have lifted them out of the Islamic world. Hmm. Okay. And all the, but the, the, what the Islamic world did with knowledge was they went to every culture and they collected it. They made their biggest project bringing all the books to them and translating them all into Arabic. They made Arabic the lingua franca. And it was like, by the end, they were paying any book you find that we don't have, we'll pay you in gold for the weight of that book. If we don't I, have that, book. I, I, th I, th we, I think we just have a disagreement on the dates. So you, you're arguing one day, and I, I doubt that one date. I think it was later on. It, it, it was earlier on that they stopped it. But you forgot in, in this film the more important moment was when he went to Toledo, right? In other words, what brought them back was this life force that's about Mary was Mary was only the mother of God, but not but not God himself. We're not the Holy Trinity. But the fact that they they venerized this life giving force and that actually was an important part away from this abstraction that actually led to in a sense this other movement within Christianity about the life force itself, you know, which Christianity always kind of had, but it was sort of, like I said, stolen to a certain degree by St. Augustine, that of this abstraction. So I think that made it more possible to brought it back into a kind of life force rather than a mere abstraction. And I think that's why the human perspective became important. Dennis switched to Italy, but remember he said very importantly that Toledo was the borderline between Islam and the Christian thing, but they went a different direction. The Islam remained an abstraction, and the Christians was about reviving, in a sense, this life force that Mary brought in, even though she was always just a woman in that sense. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't so sure how they depicted the the uh, Roman Catholic Church or whatever as the life force where, where the priests can't be involved in families and marriage and intercourse and children. But in the Islamic world, there's no such separation of the holy people from the life of, of living too. So it's sort of weird that, you know, he it pictures the Christian world as the dynamic living one Whereas you separate the church from the actual life of the people, it's kind of that was kind of weird to me. Uh, you know, it's like it's a Western take on it now. The modern Western take on there was no Islamic science, there wasn't anything. Yeah, well, they, you know, perspective in a sense seems to maybe be der derived from um, uh, uh, Al Mansir, the work of Al Haytham, which is the the optics that he developed because they already knew about color refraction and rainbows and different materials bending light differently so they actually had snell's law as as a geometric law and, you know this is they already they brought the numbers and algebra so I, it's kind of sort of hard to dismiss that out of hand i mean copernicus was about 1500s they there was a discussion on on orbits being non-circular and doubts about that uh, because the principle of doubt was the, the primary principle of their inquiry. So, um, you know, and as I said, they made these measurements. They're very impressive. They constructed observatories, which were based on the way the astral lab works, which were, you know, huge rooms where they took the angles to things and they, you know, kept huge records so that they could develop a theory. Now, they didn't develop the calculus, so it's true. We can... So to say, they didn't take it to the that level, but they did do abstract mathematics. They were the first ones where you're not told in a sequence how to take the root of 11. You're told how do you take a square root in general. So, you know, they had, had that's what their algebra was was abstracting the process of math itself. Um, okay, can I? I want to bring up a question maybe for for David then. Um, uh, the, the most interesting thing to me that you said on that last piece, which was the whole thing was pretty brilliant, by the way. I actually think we got to get <laughs> you, you and Scott a show. <laughs> and bring on Phil as a, as a guest too. 
<laughs> I mean, after this series, you know, what what are we going to call it? We're right? doing it all here. We're doing it all here, right? Yeah, this we're doing it. it all here. Anyway, so um, I want to I want to think about the your your description of the the life force between these two cultures. Okay, hmm. so we're seeing that there's the light and the dark, and we're seeing that the the, the Christian faith has a lot more to do with like resurrection and rising from an afterlife and this kind of thing. Right. And then, so the, the other, the, uh, the Arab faith, it has much more, you, you know, descriptive language, I guess, on, on, on life and light. Right. So with, you're saying it's kind of weird that they're, you know, it's the other way around or like the, the dominating culture is, is kind of like that. Is that what you're saying? Well, well I, I, let, let me make an attempt to, 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 to just, just yeah. for fun. But the, here's here's an experiment to see if I got what Dave was talking about. So so Bernowski is is using caricatures here to to help along his story because he wants to talk about moving from the atemporal mathematics to finally mechanics, which is temporal algebra. So he depicts unfairly the uh, Islamic mathematics as a fascinating with the static. So geometry is something like, because space is the, is the permanent, nothing more permanent than space. So you have the static and then calculations on the static and it's all the static repetition and, and it, it's frozen, frozen in time. Then, then he picks the Virgin Mary, uh, and, this, and this is the life force thing, because, and I think Phil made this point, uh, in, in, with the Virgin Mary you have, um, the, I guess the, the female represents the biological, and she's the biological, therefore temporal aspect of the God man who's half eternal and half temporal. So, look, look at these um, Christians. Wow, they're, they're looking at the mother, which is like the earth and like the sprouting of Easter, the resurrection, all this stuff, and that's, and that's temporal. So, that's the reason why we have uh, the calculus and time mathematics coming out of Western Europe, and that's the reason why the Arabs missed uh, temporal stuff. And Dave's pointing out, well, actually, uh, they were doing a good job uh, being super empirical and not being so anal with, like, the worship of the circle, which is the handicap for, for Kepler. Even Kepler resisted it, right? His whole life he said, no, God doesn't make mistakes. It's, it's like these people today, you know, God doesn't make mistakes. Uh, so God God would never use an imperfect uh, geometric form. It has to, be, has to be the circle. But lo and behold, the Arabs were being super empirical, Pro temporal, and there's nothing more pro temporal than algebra. Because when you have when you have a variable, that becomes the, the window for change. I mean, just, just imagine running the x across the continuum. I mean, what's what's more temporal than that? I mean, I don't think you could have time unless you have an algebraic variable. For me, the algebraic variable is just the, the greatest invention of all time. Hmm. Well, then he said that then he said that Kepler maybe did not develop mathematics, but he did began to speculate that it was elliptical, the orbits of the planet. And yeah, it was he, yeah, yeah, but he resisted it. He plotted, he plotted the movement, and he said the movement showed that it's actually not a circle, at least, right? Yeah. So uh, I don't think he had the mathematics to prove that it was elliptical, but he, he made the first step by the, by the observations. Right, he, he saw he saw from from Tico's database yeah. that it had to be in, in ellipsis, but he thought no, no, no. He you know he wanted it to fit the circle. Just like that's like this happens a lot of time in science. They 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 don't believe the result because it doesn't fit the hypothesis, and then finally they give, they give up. Right, what he didn't have, which Newton had to invent to have, and Newton just invented whatever he needed. It was like that guy was amazing. So uh, I was like in the 1200s, Al Tusi was this primo. Islamic uh, astronomer, and he argued that Ptolemy's immovable Earth was like raw, and he made the parallel to the idea of bodies falling to the way celestial bodies work, which is the concept that Newton actually carried out with his calculus. Kepler didn't even have that, I guess, or he didn't have the, the mechanism. He couldn't carry it out mathematically. That's what Newton did, which is why we give him the big credit. Right, he made it concrete in algebra, which is, yeah, they had the clay, the tools. They didn't use it like that guy. He really, he nailed the whole picture. So, yeah, the ideas are floating around, um, making it into the concrete science. You got to hand it to Newton. I mean, he's well, let, let me ask a question about that. I mean, not that I, 
he valued Newton because I think Newton was an incredible genius. But what I'm saying is that isn't there something curious about the fact that somebody could just invent a mathematics and then afterwards invent a story that explained the falling? I mean, it's like, like, okay, like, where did it come from? It came from a kind of measurements, I suppose, that 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 Kepler did, right? But he invented a mathematics. That's an invention. And now he then he had to back it up with a story of falling around the earth, right? It's like, I mean, it's a strange invention. I think both of those are kind of inventions. It actually didn't come out of nature in itself. He inputted it into nature and then realized that, you know, nature actually actually did perform this way. So that uh, the invention, the fact that inventions came through first is kind of funny. It's a little bit like an artist. I don't, think it, I don't think it came through first. I think he played with the pictures, those triangles where the triangle is a right triangle and the, the thing goes out in its orbit and then it falls and it falls in what direction? Like uh, he said, it always falls down. Where's down? To the center. Whatever it's at the center. If the sun's at the center, whatever, it falls down. So he's doing the pictures and he's counting up the triangles. And if you have infinitely many triangles or you want to approximate better and better, that's when he invents the, the kind of limiting feature, which is calculus. But he's basically doing geometry of straight and fall, geometry of straight and fall. It always is going forward and falling. And then because he has uh, a way to do velocities that change, he can make the velocity change direction. So he's, he's like taking the pictures. And when it's quantized algebraically, that, then it's up to him to make the trick, to make it all smooth out and just be, yeah, it's just the falling rule. That made the ellipse. Do you think? But don't you think? Don't you think that was imagination that came first, in a sense, though? Because, Visual. because Visual. no, because uh, it was a black hole. Because Aristotle, in his four elements, had a gravity like the Earth, which is heavy, falls, and then the water, and then the and then the air, and then the and then the fire. So he actually had a kind of primitive gravity. Maybe it's because he didn't have the mathematics that perhaps uh, Archimedes would uh, provide it to complete the story of falling, but they, they still existed in a flat world in a way, well, not really, because the Greek knew the world was not flat. So, so he actually had the fact that the, the globe was round because, because yeah. you know, the solid stuff it's fell to the middle. But the thing, he, yeah. But the thing that the Greeks did was it had to have a finite number of steps, okay? Which means you're not going to get what really happens. And if you're talking about throwing it further and further, and if you know the world's round, if you throw it hard enough, it's going to go all the way around. That requires some kind of like nearly infinite number of steps and trials, and you know, to get to that stage to show that what you're generalizing. You have to take infinitely many steps. The Greeks didn't do that kind of stuff. They just, you know, they approximated with a finite number of things. They, well, I'll just use more triangles. So I'll get pi closer. But the idea that it's a limiting process or that the square root of two is a limiting process, that's the step to infinite. Now, like the Euler, Newton, they just said, no, I don't know if it works. I'm going to do it. But they were doing it with algebra. Right? So they had this put all the powers of that together. I, I think it begins with the visualization of what little problem am I doing over and over and over? Like nature's the same at every step, right? So draw it, draw it, draw it. And you know, how well can I make it fill up the curve? Smaller, smaller, smaller. The chalice at the center of the painting was a test piece in teaching perspective. This is Uccello's analysis of the way the chalice looks. We can turn it on the computer as the perspective artist did. His eye worked like this, to follow and explore its shifting shape, the elongation of the circles into ellipses, and to catch the moment of time as a trace in space. Analyzing the changing movement of an object, as I'm doing on the computer, 
was quite foreign to Greek and to Islamic minds. They looked always for what is unchanging and static, a timeless world of perfect order. The most perfect shape to them was the circle. Motion must run smoothly and uniformly in circles. That was the music of the spheres. That's why the Ptolemaic system was built up of circles, along which time ran uniformly and imperturbably. But movements in the real world are not uniform, and they cannot be analyzed with the mathematics of antiquity. That's a theoretical problem in the heavens, but it's practical and immediate here on Earth. In the flight of a projectile, in the spurting growth of a plant, In the single splash of a drop of liquid that goes through abrupt changes of shape and direction. The Renaissance did not have the technical equipment to stop the picture frame instant by instant. But the Renaissance had the intellectual equipment, the inner eye of the painter and the logic of the mathematician. That's how Kepler, after the year 1600, became convinced that the motion of a planet is not circular and not uniform. It's an ellipse along which the planet runs at varying speeds. That means that you need a new mathematics to define that instantaneous motion. And that was invented by those two superb minds of the late 17th century, Isaac Newton and Leibniz. It's now so familiar to us that we think of time as a natural element in a description of nature. But not always so. It was they who brought in the idea of tangent, the idea of acceleration, the idea of slope, the idea of infinitesimal, of differential. And the word that has been forgotten, but that's really the best word for that, flux of time that Newton stopped like a shutter. Newton called it fluxions. Wow. Fuck, that is just brilliant, eh? Flux capacitor. That's right. So so making those rectangles tinier and tinier and tinier, finally you get a point and then you and you get a tangent. And then that from that's like the invention of the occult interior of the object. Because everyone understands that yeah it has a position. But then velocity, you know, we, we get the idea of motion, but the, that the thing contains the velocity, that, that's like an occult quality. And then you have acceleration, which is even deeper. And, and the higher the derivative, like snap, crackle, pop, and all this stuff, it's like you're getting more and more interior. Like, it's like a TARDIS, right? Uh, objects mm -hmm. become TARDIS-like when, when, when you have these higher derivatives. They, can, they contain other dimensions, like acceleration and jerk and, and all this stuff. It's like... Where is it? It's, it's something that's not in geometry, but the formalism catches it. Anyway. Right, and our physics doesn't let anything depend on anything higher than your second derivative. Like, that's our rule. You can't do that. That's because now you've maybe you've reified time or something else, whereas it's all just supposed to be a flow. Somehow, I mean, you know, I think there's something really deep under that. Um, Can you explain a little bit more about that, David, about the second derivative limit? That's interesting. I haven't heard that before. Uh, well, uh, like if if you're describing fundamental actions, then you're basically doing what Scott said. You're talking about something being a particle somewhere and it's moving. And that's enough for you to predict the future. If you need to also know how it's being accelerated, when you already know all the forces and everything else, then you, you like, you're not asking about our physics. We think it's fully defined, just knowing your velocity and position, you know, and the applied 
world, which will give you all the forces. You don't need to know how fast it was accelerating. That didn't, you know, you just need to know its velocity now and where it's starting. And every for everything in the system, that's all you need. The concept that it would be anything else would be a different way of looking at where how the world's composed. Mm. There's no memory of where it came from. It's here with this. So you're talking about like, like the Lagrangian and the Hamiltonian descriptions are complete descriptions and all they need is, is either velocity and position or momentum and position. Yeah. Uh, yeah, something in its derivative or two complementary variables, right? And that's a full description of the system. Or else you say, uh, there's probably something overdetermined here. Maybe we, maybe we could eliminate stuff. It wouldn't be like the physics we're doing. We haven't found anything that depends on anything else. So. Wow, that's really interesting. Yeah, I'm not sure. You know, once again, like Scott said, it's subtle enough as it is. I'm not sure what the implication of that is, but maybe it's like saying in a certain sense, you know, the universe is, has a flatness to it, which we're used to. And uh, that's the way it works. It's just that simple. Anything more complicated wouldn't make sense. We have I, it. I think that's why I came in about, about perhaps we're in a new, a new frontier because I actually think uh, the life force itself. That's why I think, the nature of uh, biological nature is, is, is perhaps different because it seems to be finding a different force that perhaps is in between uh, the physical forces or underneath the physical forces. Uh, you know, I, I actually asked my, when I found out about this uh, fluid dynamics in terms of, of laminar flow and, and, and turbulent flow, I asked my uh, my niece, who's who's actually an environmental scientist, and 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 I mentioned that she's oh yes, I teach that, but she's actually a mathematician, uh, more than a, a, an environmentalist. But he she does work with the mathematics in that, and she said not. I think they're beginning to look at that because, for instance, when you look at uh, airplane flights, uh, that instead of just like a, a very taper surface which uh, produces lift that's not correct in certain situations. You have to ha actually have uh, ridges at a certain edges in order to take advantage of, you know, uh, epi uh, cycles that, that uh, disturbs the flow and take advantage of that and, and, and to keep your airplane from falling. And, 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 and so therefore, in a sense, you want to put it a slightly inefficient wing is actually more efficient than an efficient wing. So I kind of think that if that's the case, if any of that is true, environmental science is really the next step because uh, perhaps it's not that the, that the, the biology actually knows something, but they figure it out just as if like we could shoot a basketball much more efficiently and much quicker than we could calculate and computate the actual curve that will go uh, before we do it uh, because we're caught in the dynamics in terms of actuality rather than the uh, analytical structure. So I kind of think that, you know, I think environmental science has something to teach us that we're finally beginning to catch up with that in a sense my thought is that hopefully we're not too late to understand that complexity and, and be able to uh, bring it in to save ourselves uh, uh, without destroying biological life in order to maintain the, uh, the physics that, that we now exist in. Yay, biodiversity. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's why I mean, when I look at something, I'm always a little edgy when the explanation is a little too sharp. And precise because I'm looking for the fuzziness or the diversity within it as a self. You know, like I said, I, I use the words, I try to use the words as poets use it, that in a sense, they use the ambiguity and the multiplicity within it. Because even in a dictionary, there are many, many definitions for at least some of the words. And I try to take advantage of that, those definitions in order to show that there's another way 
to uh, to even into into uh, something that's sort of already semi-laminate rather than turbulent. Because we do live in a turbulent world. It's not just all smooth. At, at, at the start of what you're saying, Phil, with the, with the life force, this reminded me of uh, when I was young. Well, a moment ago we were, we were talking about uh, position, fine, velocity, that's okay, and then acceleration. It's like whoa. So this, it, so it's the idea of being something inside, and force is is acceleration, it, or it's mass times acceleration. So it's more interior. So it's like it's a self-like power. So and this is the idea that there's an interior power, and this. When I was young, this reminded me of, I guess, Lucretius talked about the free will and swerving and the, the power of swerving. And so when I was young, I was a dualist, of course, and I thought, okay, so let's pretend that I'm a soul or a consciousness or I'm something that's somehow transcended the space time. I'm not just this meat. If I were to enter into this free space and be a causal force and you know break the, the causal closure and actually change history by pushing something on a tabletop, uh, it would be a force-like thing. It would be an acceleration type thing. So there's be, like, imagine your body is just like a system of orbits. If you have a free will and you, you are to do anything, you would have to be a power of swerving or an acceleration or a force that would break the, the natural ongoing mechanical orbits. And that's how you, a transcendent soul, can make a difference in this world and stamp your your being on it and make a change. You, you would have to be a force-like and interior-like, acceleration-like, power-like thing. So it's, it's a great, I always thought, yeah, that, that's the story makes well, sense. Yeah. So force is maybe another word for interaction. So when one thing in some way influences something else, that has been an interaction. Some inner thing maybe is going on in each of them, but for it to get between them, there has to be this, right. And so that would be what changes one of them from its original course to something else. So it, but it's a mystery how that happens. They've exchanged a photon. What the fuck? You know, uh, that it didn't travel from here to here, but it was like wavy enough that it could be picked up over here. And that made the change. So, but that's light. Light is the thing you know, except for like nuclear reactions. Light's a thing where we interact with the world. We see stuff, we, we can't put our hands through things because of the electromagnetic forces, which is all light interactions, all photons that stop us from doing that, right? So, and everything travels at most at that speed. And that is the speed that we can interact with anything. That's the causal lines of the universe. That's all. You're saying that so are we finally calling out of the out of the cave. Is that what you're saying? If we look at something, yeah, we were we're now in contact with it. But then, you know, uh, it was darker. I'm not sure it's different. Maybe you could have realized in the cave. So I'm not really sure. So you're 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 talking about force transference, um, which is, is only apparent because we know that it's really just the uh, the repulsion of electron shells against each other. And, you know, like like as you know, when a baseball hits a bat. They never actually make contact. They just their outer electron shells repel each other. And so what you're saying is that when a, even that is the idea of repulsion is false because it's really particle chains because we don't do fields anymore. Physics, right? It's all particle movements. That's right. It's just light. That's just light going back and forth. I mean, a photon has to be exchanged to make this electron feel the force impelling on it, right? So it's only light. It's only light going back and forth. That's it. So are, are we? Uh, I mean, if if in fact we needed calculus to understand uh, time and, and, and dynamism, then in a sense, are we at a point where we are, are limited by our language itself? You know, oh, sure. you know. I, I always think like you know, there are three levels of understanding: understanding that you could speak of, which we're, we're, we're getting so used to because that's understanding that everybody to a certain degree understands. And the understand that you can't speak off, you can only show. You know, like, how in the hell does Michael Jordan does what he does? And you don't know, he'll show you. But, oh, okay, I get it. I, I don't know how to do it. I still can't do it. And then the, there are just understanding that's beyond even that, which you just have to keep silent. This is the problem that we're always faced with, is that maybe we need a whole different language to even express it 
what the poet is able to do that we now disrespect is that the poet could at least show you the, the in-between step, which is to show you by making things that are not exactly what it means, but it sort of partially points partially to the way, kind of like Michael Jordan showing you how to make a basket that you know is fucking impossible to do, <laughs> but he did it. And so like, so the fact that we have streamlined so our language to such a laminar basis of understanding that we believe so much it is real, then in a sense, not only we have, have we excluded silence, but we have also excluded poetry. Nobody really respects poetry anymore. But don't, we, don't, we, don't we use sign? I mean, I'm not sure. Can you really check this out? How different is art from language? Because you can create language as you speak it. You can mm -hmm. use it in a way you haven't used it before. I mean, we don't so much, but look at Shakespeare. Uh, it can't, that's an art. The art, the artist can do that. And it's fluid and it changes. Like you said, concepts move all the time. Um, and it points and it's abstract, but it can also, by working, become very concrete. You can form very specific images and put people through very specific asanas and, you know, uh, feelings and relationships. So it's got all that potential. It's, it's limited, what? Our mind is limited by language or vice versa? Don't, you know, it's what's the, I'm not sure where you can draw the line there. What's stopping it? Get something new in either case. Well, I mean, look, if you just look at society, what I'm saying is that even in the 19th century, we respect the poets, you know? Uh, we, we now, it's not that we discount them, but we certainly don't respect them to the degree, you know, like, oh, you're a poet. I mean, that, you're not even a damn writer. Wait, 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 hold on. Are you saying you're you don't have have you're a poet, like, like, like... I think you're... What about Steven Spielberg? You discount he's an artist and that we don't oh, respect him? He has like a million, a billion dollars. Uh, you know, these people get respect. The language is different. It's a visual art. It's still a poetry, isn't it? Yeah, no, that's right. No, I, I'm, I'm just saying... All those things that are in that in between states. Look, if you look, if you look at art, okay, you're sure there's a market for it, but that, but, but it's not the kind of respect. It's a, you know, in fact, to the degree, you know, if you say, oh, I'm an artist, you know, it almost sounds pretentious, like, oh, you're an artist. Yeah. Bill, can I bring up a? I want to bring up a thought experiment here, uh, and hopefully, this kind of visualizes the two camps. Okay, so you got. We got this progression, which philosophically we can talk about what progress means. But let's just say that you've got a population and you go, and each person has to pick between one of two rooms. One is the artistic room. The other one is the mathematics room, right? Okay, so everything that we've been talking about tonight, about where mathematics leads to, essentially proofs and replicatable systems and these kinds of things, right? It seems to me Phil's waving the flag around to say, wait a minute, we can't forget about this other room over here, right? So, you know, let's go into that room. We open the door and we see what they're doing in there. Well, they're not doing it at all. They're not doing anything. It's a major, it's just chaos. They're representing like nothing that actually gels. Okay? Turbulence. T turbulence, whatever it is. Okay. Now, I'm going to say with one exception, there may be some, um, you know, felt experience that actually affects, you know, affects affects humanity, right? Okay, right. It might be some sort of sort of sure uh, imagined sign of like commonality in that room. But beyond that, they're pretty much not. They're doing fuck all, right? Because <laughs> that's you know, is what you, you can say. Hey guys, what are you guys doing? And they'll look, turn around, and look at you, and say, "Doing what's what's doing?" Because. <laughs> No, is it, but, but is that really true? I mean, wait a minute. I want to cave into this picture of artists. I mean, we, you got to count boogie woogie. You got to count people who are chocolatiers. Isn't all that? That's that's like art, isn't it? Art. And the math room is actually a, a, a sub compartment of the art room. I, I would mention. <laughs> there you go. Well, the what, what the what the problem with the problem with dividing the world that way is that uh, the the bathroom, if you want to put it that way, versus the uh, po poetry room, you yeah. know, is that the bathroom 
does produce very practical and useful things. Medicine, bridges, all that kind of stuff, right? Uh, so, so yes, to the degree that we are driven so much by practicality, you know, and, and that started from the very beginning because we are a weak animal and we needed the, you know, well, chip of the stone in order the doctors, to survive. Are the doctors in the art room? No. Yes, yeah, no, to no, a certain no, degree. No. I, I think in between. A real? A certain degree. A I, I think that I think there's a mixture. We can't divide the room that purely. But what I'm well, saying, here, 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 this will be helpful. Give me an example of non-art. Then, then we can continue the conversation. <laughs> because math is full of choice and satisfaction, so the connect, so it fails. It can't be non-art. So is is mechanical procedure following un, unconscious mechanical procedure following? Is that what you mean by non-art? Well, he's trying to make a good dichotomy, though. No, no, I can, I can, I can tell you what my concept of art is. I, I think it's ordered arrangement. Any, any ordered arrangement in, so it's cellular. Art. That's, that, that, yeah, that's where I. We now what we're consciously aware of because it mimics consciousness, right? Mm -hmm. I've, I've talked to Scott about this before about the Damasio model model of consciousness. It goes down to the cellular level. Right, and so then it scales up from the cellular level. It's just basically um, the the movement towards homeostasis. So it maps onto pleasure pain. Right. So when I I say that that aesthetic uh, a, a sense of beauty actually starts at those cellular foundational levels, and then move up. But just like your consciousness, you have things that we're conscious of. I'm not conscious of every cell in my body, what it's doing, the action that it's doing. Right, but there's this there's this small bandwidth that we're privy to, right? Which you know, essentially based on our senses and you know, byproduct of the projections of of our of, you know of our brains. That's kind of how I see it. So, with that definition, uh, give me an example of something that's essentially non-art and that and that would never count as art. Right? Does this help us divide right. art from non-art? Does it help us? Um, well, see, that's the thing. Like my mind would say, well, maybe it's just a non-living thing, like a, like a rock, but there's still, there's ordered arrangement inside of a rock. And so as conscious beings, we're actually aware of that beauty. Right. When I, when I was little, I, I, I sold rocks. We, we had egg rocks in, in our front lawn. I would spray paint them silver and pr break them in half. And there's all sorts of exciting crystalline structures. So yeah. like, like space art, right? Like a, from a night, like a Gernsbach art object. It was silver on one side, then it had a bunch of like crystally stuff on the other side of the one dollar. Anyway, so I so I can't think of anything that can't be appropriated in artistic uh, construction. It's a geode. Yeah, geode. That's right. That's right. Yeah. All, all these rocks were geodes. That's right. All of them were every single one. I guess my, I guess huh. my parents were upset about that because they were expensive uh, rocks. So for that, I have to say all things are art. Then, if that's the case, right? No, I, I just want an example of something that's not that it's essentially non-artistic that 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 you could never be, could never be used as a medium for artistic expression. And and the thing for me, the only example I could come up with is, is blind, unconscious procedure following. Isn't that what we really mean by saying that's not artistic? But I, I'm just proposing this, and uh, who knows? You know, it, it might be something that's non-communicative and non-reusable. It's private, you know. I'm not sure that, uh, you know, if you if it means nothing to anyone and it's not ever going to be done again, it's just like a personal acts. That's not art. So maybe living is an art, but then again, there's a way you could look at living as entailing yeah. making well, it an art because you're connected. I, I think that division is very difficult. Yeah. Once you it put it, maybe perspective. Once you put it, a hard division is very difficult. I would say that. In a sense, nowadays it almost seems like plastic comes very close to non-art. Plastic. Very cool. <laughs> what is plastic? Plastic. Yeah. Plastic. Yeah. yeah, but 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 I'm being a little facetious because obviously you can make art out of plastic. I, but what I I'm have... saying is that it's quite it's quite useless in, in one sense. But we're, but we're we're kind of stuck with it because it's it's actually in in many ways very very efficient. Who's yeah. that artist that doesn't make any art, but he puts his name on everything and he charges a million dollars? He made a oh, yeah. in Las Vegas. He has a, a teddy bear that looks like it's made of balloons, but it's made of chrome. Yeah. Who's that guy? I, I don't know. 
Christo, is it? No, I haven't. No, it's not but, I, but I have something to add to Scott's piece here, I think. So yeah. Scott tried to put a like kind of a, a dichotomy in place, right? With by kind of throwing out the question of what is not art. Okay, now let me see if this makes sense. Okay, um the Duchamp on a wall. Okay, so the, the artist Duchamp takes the you know take takes a urinal and I think he turns it upside down and sticks it on an art gal gallery wall, right? Okay. Well, no. Yeah. Right. So, so the, the the trap that I don't want you guys to fall into is to say that's not art because it's just not art from some sort of cultural response. And I can keep going to explain what I mean in, in terms of a cultural response, but I'll just say you guys understand that, right? It's a it's a cultural a cultural byproduct that you know that's not art that should be hanging in a gallery kind of thing, right? Or a derivative of that sort of thinking, right? What I'm actually referring to is that if the if the if the Duchamp on the wall originates from this this creativity of um, of say of 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 negation, right? So now I'm, I'm talking about a metaphysical description here of what's not art. Is you you look at a particular piece of art and say, well, this is not art. So you're making something out of the negative, right? Mm. As a statement to say. Well, if that's art, then that's also art. It's like you've abstracted negative, or you've yeah. you've abstracted what it's not. I think that's part of conceptualism as a practice in art. Conceptual art points at itself as a dilemma about being art. You know what I mean? So that, that that's I think that's been incorporated into the art world. Will do that to show you that they can violate norms and create art intentionally as something which you would you know not have defined as art, but now because it's intentional, crafted, meaningful in a certain way. Oh, well, that's what art was, yeah. <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, I, I have a good example along those lines. I oh, think here's the guy, he's a, he doesn't make anything himself. He just, he pays, he gives engineers like a, like verbal instructions. Yeah. And then he signs it and sells it for millions and millions and millions. I, I, oh, yeah, right, his yeah. name is Jeff Koons. Okay, I'm done. That's what I said. It is Jeff Koons. It is Jeff Koons. But then, uh, didn't, didn't, didn't having artists always use their, their students to finish their art and then sell the art on? At, at one point, yes. Yeah, sure. yes, Ruben, yes, Ruben had, a, had a lot of apprentices, and, and they just put the final touches. Yeah, that's true. Uh, absolutely. But I want to tell you a project that I heard from the artist himself, and it was very interesting. I think he lived in Oakland, and uh, this was several years ago. Well, it was at least 10 years ago. He told me about it 10 years ago, so probably like 12, 13 years ago. Uh, in Oakland, there was a very interesting uh, mm -hmm. uh, Vietnamese restaurant, but it was just a hole in the wall that the neighborhood just came and buy the food. It was, it was very good. It, 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 in, in Vietnamese, the thing is called the horse. In, in Vietnamese, okay? And this artist went and right across the street constructed this very fancy place, a read furbish, this very fancy place, and call it the horse in English, right? And it was very fancy tables and all that. And, 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 and of course, only the real hip people and the artists came to it. It was the opening. And what, what it was was that you come in at those very fancy plates and all that, and the waiters, everything, and then you would order. You order that they have a menu. It was exactly like the guy, the people across the street. You order, and they and, got the food from across the street. I'm just guessing. Yeah. No, that, that's right. They took down the thing, and they went across the street, and and the, there were windows. So that this wasn't like uh, oh secret. It was a window, and they could see the guy going out buy the food. <laughs> you know, and those little, you know, uh, paper cups or whatever it is. And then he would dish it out on this fancy, <laughs> fancy plates. And then you would be charged a whole lot of money for it. Yeah, so it was really, it was really a play on not only imitation, but that blows it away, but also uprising. So it was a comment about capitalism, right? It was like, and everybody was in it. Because everybody came to this and they saw what's happening that they were being taken advantage of. 
<laughs> right? Yeah, you should have this as a painting, you know, like make a painting of this, right? And just call it authenticity or something, right? So, so the guy that made the horse, he was making fun of someone who would make something like the horse, right? No, I I think that I think the people of the horse actually actually knew it, and they were they were with it in a sense because it really bought them more fame in a way, right? Because now all the artsy things were they there ironically people. making fun of people that would be customers at a restaurant like the horse? Well, in a way, in a way, but 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 they were in on it too because they were sort of <laughs> making fun of themselves. So so it was it was very interesting how how they weren't keeping it a secret. It wasn't like the Republican, let's keep it a secret. It's kind of like, it's just open. Everybody knows they're pulling a fucking scam. <laughs> but everybody was in on the scam, it, including the people who are being taken advantage of. Careful, Phil. We're gonna still get exist? Banned. Phil, we're going to get banned by YouTube. Stop saying that stuff. I think that was a wonderful piece because it, it, it sort of, it sort of exposed something that's even deeper that we're attracted. First of all, we're attracted by, uh, at this point now, by even scams because it's so familiar to us. But we're also uh, exposing scams, and we're talking about politics through that piece. You know that capitalism is really taking advantage of people. You know, if you go up the price, and that's what everybody's doing. You know, they're taking something and they're putting a brand on it, and by dressing it up, it just like makes it more expensive, right? Eh? So it's a very interesting piece. I thought now I thought that was a wonderful piece of art because now the imitation is better than the original. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. That that's a really cool thing to have happen. It falls into that same theme of, you know, the sum is greater than you know, than its parts, right? And right. I think you can experience this in relationships or at least I have and so I could fortunately say that you know, you have your your kind of ideal way of being and trying to strive towards as a decent human being, these kinds of things, right? You meet the right person. It sounds cliche in, all, in, in this, but, you know, you, you realize and look back on your relationship and go, fuck, I've actually become a better person. And for anybody in doubt with that, you can look at, well, shit, I've been with someone and I've actually kind of been a, a worse off person for that. So... <laughs> People can change, I think. People can change each other. Their relationships actually um, matter. So Does that restaurant still exist? I don't know if it exists because it seems to me at some point it will get old. In other words, like just like branding, you know, like you go unless you change the brand to update the brand, it just gets worn out like it's it's disposable. It's you kind remember, of a disposable. Do you remember word. that that iPhone app called I Am Rich? It was, it was, and so Apple store had a, a, a maximum price that you could charge, which was $999 and 99 cents. So this guy made an app that cost nine ninety nine ninety nine, 99 and the app was nothing but a red screen, a chintzy <laughs> shitty graphic of what looked like kind of like a hexagonal <laughs> red gem. And it said, I am rich. And seven people bought this, and the guy made seven thousand dollars. <laughs> but he wasn't supposed to be a joke. He, he just realized that there are people that are that are status conscious, and that yeah. people would buy it just so they could say, "Look, I'm an asshole that that <laughs> bought a hundred dollar bag of potato chips because the bag says hundred dollar potato chips, and you want to be seen holding it as you walk out the store." <laughs> yeah, we do live in that world now. So that that that's just kind of interesting that art has moved. To that level, and and and, and, and it is a criticism, but it. It was all, but it's also a self-criticism that's sort of being ironic to itself as well as to the other people. So I, I I gotta really I'm I'm really this is a really key learning moment here I think, with with what Scott just said. So the idea is that can you look at that as the foundation to power? How? That oh, wow. that desire, that proclivity, that 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 drive to want to have that uh, control of the surplus. Well, if you if you yeah. want to um, utilize that aspect of people, which I think is inherently an evil, but you know, un, unreflected need to display ostentatious value and, and to have it, procure it, and, you know, use it for no utility. Um, yeah, that could be exploited. Now, is that having power 
or is that like you know utilizing human weakness or are you talking about the people who buy it having power what do you yeah well i'm just what i'm saying is is that it's it seems to be like a, a big relational database so there's other there's other um like studies where if um if i'm giving uh, like a, a reward right? And my neighbor's given a, a reward. My perception of that reward changes based off of the size of my neighbor's reward, right? So there's this kind of um, like even biological uh, evidence with, 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 um, with primates, right? That they get into this kind of thing. And I think they've done some, you know, game theory sort of theorizing in, in, in how this replicates and in populations. And so on the on the high end level of what we're talking about, it's like it seems that that's kind of the extreme. What Scott's talking about is that at the at the far end of that spectrum, right, the far end of that spectrum, we've got a society that has the ability to have someone just buy something so that they can, uh, you know, throw it out if they want to. Basically, it's absolutely really worthless to them, but it's it somehow gives, you know, we've got these like stratospheres of, of 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 class you know uh, yeah so we have uh, people look we all have areas i suppose but we have a lot of unreflected living we do and here are people where you're looking to see if they have absurd resources and express them in a way that can be manipulated because they are completely unreflective people mm -hmm. I bet there's a lot. P.T. Barnum said there are a lot of them, but you know how many are rich. So, you know, there's a, the, a power law about how many are going to have how many resources. So if you're going to go for the top, you might as well go for the big bucks, right? I mean, you know, uh, as opposed to a typical pyramid scheme, which is just going for numbers. I, I, I think I think I think that's a society in which you uh, a couple of things in which you have to have a society of excesses to begin with, right? to get to that point where you no longer care about money. But you also have to have a society where there's a large gap between the, between the haves and have not. Because once you get to a point where you already have the best that could be, there is nowhere else to go except to be one better, which is to, like I said, uh, throw coal, go, go foil on, on top of your shishi and eat it. I mean, like, and people do that, right? It's kind of like that's one upsmanship. I could, I could throw this money away, but you have to have such an excess that you could actually afford it, which means that I, I could even do that. And even you're just rich. I'm very rich. You can't do that. So that one upsmanship is very important. But it's also important in terms of people who don't have it, and they have this nostalgia and this longing. Maybe longing is a better word uh, for wanting to be that person. And I think Donald Trump is playing that car, even though he's an imposter, he's really not that rich. But he's playing that car where like, God, you know, I wish I could be like Donald Trump. And yeah. they're buying into it. They're not, they're not looking after themselves that they're actually being undercut. They're just buying into it because like he is actually showing them that you could be this too, which is a lie, but nonetheless, it's become true enough. So I kind of think you have to have both, an excess on the top and also a, a, a di differentiation so the top people could compete for that and the bottom people could wish they were there so they could be like that as well. So it's like, it's like it, you know, a really superficial uh, material representation yeah. of value for this yeah. to work. I mean, if, if what you're talking about was the app is you have a really great yacht. Well, then we have to build all these yachts. It's not, it's not like, you know, and that they can have fun and use those to travel around and go swimming. You know, you know it's like a lot of value. To, there's real, real human living value to like a boat. But to this thing, uh, it's just there's no actual. It's just it does it give you a, an opium hit? You know, does it do a, a mental thing? Do you insult people? Do you, you know, make people smile or frown or impress them? It's really, uh, you can learn just to, be nice to people and have the same effect that uh, make them happy or sad or, you know, so it's, there's no value to it. So it's a material 
a way to transform material into representing value and getting people to invest in that material, like what Donald Trump does. You know, you need material. You could have material. There'll be material for you. You know, as though you don't have value, you can't see yourself as having value. You must. You got to have something for my machine here. I'll sell you some. So it, it's falling for that kind of representation of value. How many people will fall for that? I mean, that's what advertising, you know, so that P.T. Barnum are all about. It's only a paper moon, right? Yeah, it's all about creating neediness, incompleteness, insecurity, sadness, insufficiency. So marketers are like mental health in reverse. So you watch a commercial and then you feel less complete, less whole, more needy, more attached, and then you buy some piece of shit and that's supposed to make you feel better and you realize you're still you're still upset because there's more commercials telling really you that it really hooks up with capitalism great you know but it could probably work in a lot of systems but you know it's a real good match for material capitalistic industrial world you yeah. you guys but I, do you guys understand that you know from a business man's perspective that 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 not all marketing is like that Right. There, there is marketing that tries to say, you know, hey, you know what? Two dudes have a good idea and they're trying to put their idea out and they're trying to do it as, as truthful as possible. Ben and Jerry. They were good like that. Yeah, yeah there's hope for that. Right. Well, that's I'm, like, not, that's I'm, not even, I'm not even sure about that. I'm not even sure. I'm, more cynical. I'm not even sure about that because like. The, not to speak against Ben and Jerry because I think they are good, but but now we have we have a thing in which you uh, the danger is, is that the original inventors, the people who are trying to be good, they either like sell on they become like the other, or else they are actually just sort of like making this thing so they could get out in the middle level and collect the money and sell it to the people who are really abused the system, right? So, so the whole thing about venture capital is that you invest in startup capital, and then they they get to a point where the company actually shows that they're you know going to make money, they're going to do good, right? And so they're being bought off. And a lot of people, inventors, are into that system. They just want to get to a point of getting bought off, and then they go collect their money and say, "Oh, that's good," right? And now the next generation who are actual businessmen is going to run it in a way to make money. So even the even the good people to a certain degree it's going to be bought off on some level. I mean it's just a matter of when. So it, it it's it's just very difficult in this particularly in this form of capitalism because in the old days the guy who actually did the thing was proud of what he did. You know, he he'll stick with it and that the really decent people will actually pay the workers at least a decent amount, right? Because he, he sees it as a community thing. But now, like, just let the business people take over. The original person who invented the company or whatever it is right. was maybe trying to do a good thing. But now even the inventors, they just want to get to the, the stage where they can sell it off and, and, and you know, and, and get the get the buy-in thing. It's like, oh, God, this is so great. So look at that. We've gone from Pythagoras to the fact <laughs> I love no. it. I think we're right on track. We've gone right back to the fact that if you numerize, numeratize, monetize, quantify everything, you really suck the marrow. There's nothing but bone anymore. The life is gone. The blood is out. And if you get people to buy into the abstraction, the Bitcoin, you know, which is like, you really want to make that the way the world works? And they, uh, maybe they're, we could talk politically about what Bitcoin, but, but they, you know, what, what Phil is saying, just the fact that you have something of value being expressed in the world, and we have a process to put it in a meat grinder and monetize it and take all the meaning and utility and humanity out because we can make a bean and a buck, and I can make more beans by destroying your company than I can by you know, letting you keep making that stuff because it'll affect my income. We have used the abstraction of money because of it's good. We've been really confused by turning the numbers into the value or like not 
distinguishing them. I think we talked about this last time, was it in this group? Economics, not measuring the values of things, just measuring the money of things and calling it utility and goods. No, no, the goods, like what's good for people, like having water and air, you know, goods. So we did talk about this. So Pythagoras, brilliant, the power of it, but it's also a warning that you can't turn everything into one, two, three. Right. And this is the perversity of, of exchange value, where you can say so many squirrels equal so many oranges. It's just madness. But so exchange value versus use value and the commodity form are two very perverse, fully quantified things ready to go. Yeah. I think you should have a Marxism series, too. Uh, uh, uh.